You may have noticed in the uh, bulletin that I've recently been asked to speak uh, as a keynote speaker at an upcoming benefit peace conference to coincide with the International Day of Peace on the 21st of September. It's been organized to benefit the Appen Hall Children's Foundation, a worthy Australian organization whose aim is to provide for the relief of poverty, disability, sickness, suffering, distress, misfortune, destitution, or helplessness. Its vision is to build a respite and learning center for children at risk in Tasmania and Australia, and eventually a refuge and a safe haven for children orphaned by war in other countries. That's their goal, hence the conference to raise money. Guest speakers include Ernie Dingo and other national and international notables, and you can find out more on pearlsofpeace.com.au. But plugging that event and plugging Appen Hall is not my real purpose in addressing you today. This also gets me out of being seen to be self-serving. If you come along to that conference and hear, have heard what I'm going to say today, you should probably go to listen to what others have to say that you wouldn't have had a chance to hear otherwise. Other people will have to pay for this. You get it here for nothing. Mainly, when they asked me to speak at this, uh, my first question, my first reaction was, there must be some mistake. Um, and what I've been wrestling with is, what the hell am I going to say? Uh, there have been um, demonstrations for peace in our experience, marches, mass prayers, chantings for peace. There are even conferences like the one on International Peace Day, organizations dedicated to peace. In fact, there are centers for peace studies. And you can even take a tertiary undergraduate, graduate, or postgraduate degree in peace studies. From the time of the League of Nations until the present United Nations, there have also been world-encompassing organizations dedicated to the negotiation and maintenance of peace on Earth. And none of them have availed. None of them. So what can yet another conference do but preach to the converted and generate sympathetic responses that feel worthy but are in fact useless? My heart, I confess, sinks a little bit when I consider this. I mean, what can we actually do about world peace? Not really much, you might think. We might may, will not really avail to pray and express outrage when people with the misfortune to be born in other countries, strife-torn countries, are being raped and killed. Do we somehow believe, against all the evidence, that simply holding the correct feelings about violence will somehow help. This ethic cannot, can never, avail. Of course, we can and should protest, and protest has indeed curtailed the duration of violence, but it's never prevented it. And certainly we should do all that we can to advance the cause of peace. The question is, what can we do? Now, let's not kid ourselves, though. Wringing our hands, carrying placards, wielding all the votes in the world, will not transform the world to a peaceful one. We may as well wear ropes of garlic to ward off vampires. Because the problem is not out there in the world. The problem is in here and here. There have been lots of prescriptions for world peace. Religious prescriptions, utopian prescriptions, political prescriptions, social and economic prescriptions psychological prescriptions, all of them have comprehensively failed or failed to take root and flourish. Why? We say at the outset that I don't think world peace is ever likely to happen in any absolute sense. And I don't think this makes me a cynic, just a realist. The biggest letdown in my lifetime, on this front at least, was the end of the Cold War. How many of you remember, like me, the vi visions of the Berlin Wall falling? which represented an end of a nearly 50-year Cold War, which never seemed to have an end short of mutually assured destruction. And we thought, as I'm sure I did, as I'm sure you did, wow, it's over. Now we can get on with making a better world. We can slash military spending, channel the funds into making our schools cathedrals. We can, we can redress inequity. We can, we can, we can make a health care system. How wrong 
we were. No, my friends, peace in any sense will never come about unless and until something in our essential nature changes. It's a sign of the times here in South Australia. The state government has poured millions of dollars into job-creating defense industry jobs. And as a result, in the university sector where I work, defense industry-related degree programs are skyrocketing in their enrollments. Strangely, though, the universities seem a little embarrassed by this and have dubbed the courses, get this, <clears throat> Applied Tactical Engineering <laughs> or Strategic Tactical Communication. Forget the full fee paying foreign students, this is going to be the new cash cow for the South Australian universities. And what a shame. Students who might otherwise be working toward any energy efficient technologies, uh, improving solar cell capacities, making breakthroughs in medicine, or even ah, chunk harder, taking three years to immerse themselves in the arts and humanities, are essentially going to be learning how to build an even better bomb. And of course, the university prospectuses don't say that. They don't say it because it's shameful. But this is not news. Armaments have always been big business, and as long as money is the only thing that drives public policy, it always will be. So I'm not optimistic about a utopian vision of a peaceful world. Not when the Israeli Defense Force announces its new, fast, multi-lethal, state-of-the-art tank named the Zayin, the Sword of David. No kidding. To deal with Hezbollah street gangs who might occasionally lob the low-tech firecracker missile into their settlements. Nor when private mercenary armies like Blackwater, which, by the way, if the United States were South America, you'd call them death squads. When private armies like Blackwater operate in other nations outside the control of any law. Not when young men and women voluntarily train to become professional killers and a, na and a grateful nation calls it honor and duty. If our forces in Iraq or Afghanistan were made up of conscripts, there would be no popular support for these actions. So let us set aside the fairy tale that the human race is ever going to be at peace. Instead, I want to suggest that peace is more usefully thought of not as a political goal, but as a personal one. Let us not let the idea of a perfect world prevent us from doing what's possible. When I first started making notes about this, a tune leapt into my head, what the Germans call, artfully, an earworm. <laughs> it's a tune you've heard sometime in your life, you know, that sort of floats to the surface for no particular reason and gets stuck in your head. It's actually a hymn I learned as a Catholic decades ago. It goes, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And so while world peace may not be within our reach, inner peace might be, but alas, my friends, inner peace is likewise a battlefield let me illustrate. Sometimes when I'm feeling cheeky with friends, I get out a, a little slim volume called The Book of Questions. It, it poses annoying moral questions that are meant to tease out conversation from people and determine what they really think. Questions like, would you go to a slaughterhouse and butcher a cow? Followed by, do you eat meat? Things like that, meant to annoy you. So I asked a friend of mine this one, if you could cause, this is in the book of questions, if you could cause the death of anyone simply by closing your eyes, visualizing them, and saying goodbye, goodbye, they would die of natural causes, there was no possible way you could be caught or ever found out, would you? Who would you? 